Very good. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is the talk about open source seriously. You can choose whether there is a question mark or an exclamation mark after that statement. But I hope at the end of this presentation that you will all have an exclamation mark or at least a dot, sort of passive aggressive dot uh, there at the very end. So uh, just to change around a, a little bit, do the right branding. Uh, Good. OK. It's the 17th of May, everyone. Congratulations. It's the National Day of Norway. I'm from Norway, so that's really important. And uh, in Norway, that's a lot about uh, children going in parades down the street, waving flags. We gave away all of our tanks to Ukraine, so that's uh, why we do the children. Um, it would have been terrible to do the opposite. Uh, so yes. Um, when we start a presentation, it's always good to start with the important stuff. So talking about myself, of course. I am Matthias Bortlesniak, and uh, I am from just outside of Oslo in uh, Norway. Norway is far away. Uh, right now, I'm based in Hawke's Bay, which is much closer. Uh, it's about an hour's flight, four and a half hours drive uh, from here um, in New Zealand. And um, also, uh, the reason why I'm there right now is that my wife is a Kiwi, and we're trying out New Zealand on our kids, uh, see if they get spots or something like that. Um, I've been working with Typo 3 since 2003, when I crashed my first installation of uh, that CMS. Uh, I can crash Drupal any day, uh, but yeah. That, you know, that's the way you learn. You crash things, and then you try to fix it afterwards. Uh, my way to do that was to try to write my own CMS for about six months. And that did not work out. Uh, so I went back to Type 3. And now I'm a part of the Type 3 Association board, uh, which is not boring. Uh, and I'm uh, an open source evangelist at Tuju, um, working here in New Zealand. So. Back to open source, seriously. Because this is going to be about open source on a fundamental level. But before I do more about open source, I'm going to answer the question you're all sitting with right now, which is, what the heck is Typo 3? Well, Typo 3 is a PHP-based CMS. You've never heard about anything like that, right? Uh -huh. Uh, well, um, it's also free and open source, totally unknown. Uh, and uh, it's community driven. Who's heard about that before? Uh, and uh, yeah, it's backed by an association. How funny. <laughs> Who does that? Uh, and uh, it's uh, got a long history. We're actually 25 years uh, this year, so that's how long our history is. Um, and um, the point I'm trying to make here is, of course, that Typo 3 is quite similar to Drupal, if you look um, below the surface, because there's different concepts and there's different ways of doing things. But really, let, let's have a, a look just to, to show you the real uh, similarity here. So I took a look at. You know, I downloaded the uh, default base installation of Drupal and uh, the default base installation of uh, Typo 3. So Drupal is in version 10. We just released Typo 3 version 12. Uh, yeah, we skipped version 5 for different reasons. So that's an unlucky number um, in the Typo 3 world. Um, so OK, if you look, look at the dependencies in Drupal 10, there is 54 dependencies in a composer-based install. In Typo 3, there's a little bit more. It's 98 dependencies. That's, we can discuss that for a very long time, but that's uh, just the number of dependencies. But the important thing that I want to show you today is that actually the similarities are down at the bottom here. We have 33 dependencies in common. 
And if you look at older versions of, of Drupal and Typo3, there's even a, a little bit of Typo3 in Drupal. It's gone now, uh, but see, we're really good friends, actually. And uh, I think we should become better uh, friends, and I'll, I'll show you why. So this is Drupal and Typo3. You know, usually when you talk to people from Drupal or Typo3, it's a lot about, you know, we're best, and, you know, they did all of those mistakes, and haha, uh, yeah, all of the things you hear from people who love Drupal and don't love ty Typo3, and the people who love Typo3 and absolutely hate, you know, that's not the right way of thinking. Um, we have so much in common, and there's an important perspective to that as well. Let's say that another CMS comes along, it's PHP-based and open source and whatever. Let's call it uh, WordStar, right? Uh, and what sometimes happens with uh, the open source community is, you know, we look at them and we say, oh, you know, they're new, they've done something here. We wouldn't have done it that way. We've been here 25 years. Yeah? But, uh, you know, suddenly it combusts. And uh, there is a huge security issue, and we're like, whoo hoo, ha, ah, good, we've been here for 25 years because we're, you know, we wouldn't have done that, but, you know, now they're totally, yeah, out of the market. But actually, what happened to that CMS there actually very much affects us because there is a dark cloud looming above us in the open source world. Yeah, it's the proprietary vendors. And do you know something about the proprietary vendors? Hmm. They talk about open source as one. They, they're gonna say, you know, look at what happened with that security issue in open source. That's why you have to choose proprietary. That's, you know, don't choose Drupal, don't choose Type of 3, don't choose anything that's open source. And I mean, I still meet people at conferences where I say, you know, I'm from an open source CMS. And they go, oh, open source. Yeah, I tried that once. Yeah, right? So that really tells us what people see when they see our marketplace. They very often choose between proprietary or open source in their mind. And we need to be there too. And we need to understand that this isn't a battle between Drupal and Typo3 or other open source CMSs. It's primarily about taking open source seriously. So the first choice when you get a new client or you talk to someone is not well, are you going to choose Adobe or Drupal? What's your choice? Or for me, you know, are you going to choose, uh, let's say, Sitecore? Yeah. Or a Typo3? Proprietary? No. You know, none of those are really good questions when you start with a client. The real important question should be, are you going to go for proprietary or open source? That is the battle we have to win together. So when it comes to choosing a new system for your client, of course, choose open source. Then you choose the CMS or the system that works for the client I know a lot of Type of 3 sites that have been built because the agency knew Type of 3, but Type of 3 didn't actually fit for the client. It's not good for open source when we just base ourselves on whatever platform we know and then it doesn't actually fit for the client. That's bad marketing in the end because people go and say, like this guy I met at a conference a month ago now, who said, you know, yes, I tried open source and it didn't work. Well, whose fault is that? Is that his fault? Or maybe he simply was introduced to the wrong tool. 
And we have to ask ourselves those questions. And then you choose the best agency. And that's also something we very often forget, that when we sell open source software, so, well, we don't sell open source software, do we? Well, we sell our expertise with the software. And that is also important. If you know that somebody can do things a lot better than you, maybe you should be honest and say that, well, you know, in my agency, we work a lot with this kind of stuff. We don't have experience with this. Maybe you would get the best result we're working with this agency, or maybe you should simply collaborate. And then I know some of you in the room here are asking, but why is open source the obvious choice? Well, it's not only a technology choice. And the reason is here, in the desert. Well, everyone. The desert is a very good picture of closed source. It's a monoculture, sand, and it creates dependence. Whoever owns the watering hole owns the people, right? It's the only place you can go to get water. That's a proprietary way of thinking. On the other hand, we have ah, open source. Well, open source is diversity to the extreme, of course, but it really points to giving people freedom. That's why we say free and open source. You have the freedom to make what you want. There is no dependence here, but if you look at the biology here, there is, of course, interdependence. Well, we share dependencies, right? There is interdependence between Drupal and Typo3. So when you compare these two, you know, the water hole owner, well, once you know where the water hole is, it's easy for you as long as you have no problem with the water hole owner. You can just lean back and relax, right? Well, open source doesn't always make it easy, but it asks something from you. It asks you to make the change that you want to see. And I, well, is this you? Well, imagine that this is your garden, right? You've been redoing your house or something. Your problem here is that you don't have a car, or at least not a pickup or a ute, as it's called around here. But you have a friend who has, right? So you, you call up your friend and you say, oh, God. Oh, my garden is looking like this, you know? Can you come and help me with your car and we'll drive it off to the dump and clean up? And your friend says, yeah, sure, of course. I'll do that with you. Well, when you're finished, you might, you know, give your friend a few dollars to cover petrol or something, the cost of enablement. But you're not going to ask your friend is not going to ask you to pay him or her by the hour, right? Because that's what friendship is about. It's a kind of love, right? And it very much describes open source as well. We just give something away without expecting something back. We might actually ask for a payment for the download, for the enablement, but it's really there for free. It's a type of love. And it's really unconditional love, which is really nice. A nice thought. It's not the, the sticky kind of uh, love. It's, it's a different kind of love. And that has to be a conscious effort to think that way when you work with open source. Open source takes more than one person. It takes you and a friend. It takes you and multiple friends. And it requires a number of things. It requires commitment, contribution, community, and cooperation to really work. You can't lean back with open source, but it asks something of you. And I think that's actually a really healthy question. And a lot of what you guys do in your open source community is also what we could call development cooperation. 
Well, you cooperate about development. Well, development cooperation is another word that's also used outside in the rest of the world, but it means something slightly different. It means what you might call development aid, right? But it's not, it's not aid, it's cooperation. It's working together. And in the Type of 3 Association, we had an experience with that, the difference between aid and cooperation. And it all began with a phone call. Yeah, that's how our phones look. Uh, we got a phone call from the random government. Hmm, you get a lot of those? Well, it was real. And they said, hi, we've got 250 type of three installations. Uh, they're old, we need to upgrade them. Can you help us? Um, we said, oh, <laughs> sure. Uh, but how are we going to do that? Are we going to do, well, we could you know, recommend an agency that we've got, ask them to make a proposal. It's going to cost this and that much, and they'll get the stuff done. But then we thought, you know, is that the open source way? Because very often when it comes to this kind of thing, it starts out that this is actually the way that a lot of governments promote helping developing countries today. You take an established business that opens a local office in the developing country, and then they earn lots of money and they ex export it, right? Because that's what the business is about when you do it from a business perspective. And you get all of these things that you actually, what you're doing is that you're building dependencies. You're building a desert where someone comes in and they can take the whole market because they're rich. They have millions in marketing, right? Well, if you look at that from a historical perspective, that is both colonialist and exploitative because it doesn't really take the best out of the country that you're in and use it there. You just take out the money and place it somewhere else. So we thought, how can we do that from the open source spirit? Well, what we thought was that we could use our community, our open source community, to create independent local business and expertise in Rwanda. That is different. So we talked to our member agencies, and we ask them to donate time. We paid travel and food and stuff to Rwanda. And we sent our experts down to train local web agencies to help their government upgrade their websites. This is how it looked. It was a number of trips down to, to Rwanda to do this. So basically, the government in Rwanda could use their money to pay their taxpayers to do a job for them instead of paying someone from the outside. And we gave away our expertise. And this is the result. It's now up at 270 websites. The, it will probably be about 500 in the end. And if you look at this as a newspaper headline, I'm sure it's not going to be like this in a, in a newspaper. Basically, the essence of what we did is that we took our democratic and not-for-profit open source project and used it to support sustainable and independent local business. And from the perspective of fighting colonialism and exploitation and those kind of things. There's three words here that are important. One is that it was locally led. So it wasn't someone coming in and doing it for anyone there. It was locally led, so it based itself in the place where it was done. It was also non-exploitative and it was anti-colonial. And when you talk to aid workers and NGOs about that, they go like, ah, oh, yes. But 
for us, there's actually one other word here that is much more important for, for our project. And that is community. Because community is what we want to grow as an open source project. We want to not have more people have websites made by existing agencies. We want more agencies to work with open source. And being in a community also has some really important values connected to it. If you're in a community, you have to be your best. Otherwise, the community will not work. If you're in a community, you have to deal with stuff like governance. And a good way to do governance in a community is also democracy, for example. And governance, working with interests in a community, that's also something that is called civil society. I'll get back to that. But that's what community does when you have to collaborate. You can't just be dependent. You have to be active yourself. So the values of open source, it turns out, are actually the values of a healthy society. And open source is actually civil society. It's a part of civil society. And if you wonder about what civil society is and the importance of it, well, let me just say one thing about civil society. Civil society won the Nobel Peace Prize last year. That is where open source connects in to the greater society. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because we can continue doing open source as sort of our little island. But if we really think about what open source really means, well, look at the world today. Democracy is under attack. There's a lot of things happening that are working against these community values that we also work with. And when you work with open source, you're training yourself in doing the right thing for your country and your local community. So you're actually strengthening civil society here in New Zealand and Australia, wherever you live, by working with open source in a community with other people. And that is why we should really take open source seriously. Not only as something that we use, but as the community that we're a part of and look beyond our individual projects and see all of the connection points that we have to other open source projects. Because by working together and understanding the value of that, that is how we can really fight proprietary software with open source. Thank you. So the question is, how do I see competing uh, open source CMSs finding, well, their way, uh, their way to exist in the market uh, without it destroying each other? Well, I think, you know, back to the picture of the desert, uh, we don't want a monoculture because it would be just as bad if there was a monopoly on Type of 3 or on uh, Drupal in the world. That would not drive development, really. And it would not benefit the people who day after day work on the dependencies that our CMSs depend on. And I think, you know, yes, there is a kind of competition, but I like to point to the agencies more on that. I mean, what expertise can you bring in that will make Drupal work for your client? in the best possible way? That is the real question. And then we have to be frank with each other and say that, well, there are definitely projects for Type of 3, and there's projects for Drupal. And the other CMS would not really work as a good solution for that. And on the other side, in some cases, you have to say that, well, both can solve the same problems. Well, 
then you have to look to the agencies. You have to look at the expertise and say, well, who is here who can solve this question in the best possible way? And then, apart from that, I think we should forget about the competition part. And I think we should collaborate because we, well, it's not a good argument to say, you know, Drupal is better than Adobe because there's so many more values in open source that if you choose open source for all of your solutions in your government or in your business, that's going to have benefits beyond your technical website solution, right? And I think that we need to get together to support our upstream providers to make sure that what we're building our software on is actually good and solid and supported. And we have to take our communities and learn from each other because that's also something that can come from the proprietary world that, you know, they've got a crappy community. Well, we have to learn community best practices and help each other become communities that can really, really make good software. Because that's the way we're all going to win in the open source world by cooperation. So uh, the answer is how we can uh, can I shorten your question? Well, the, the proprietary systems have a lot of marketing money, for example. We do not. And how can we work with that? Um, well, of course, it's everybody's dream to have a lot of money. Uh, you know, if you're not a member of the Drupal Association, for example, become one. It's a great way to support your open source project and help them actually do marketing on your behalf. But on the other side, we have these values that are much bigger than just the business. And if it's something that you can talk about that's bigger than your project, talking about values is a way to get into government. Talking about values is a way to get into corporations because they also want to mostly do the best for their citizens, do the best for their clients, do the best for the world. And that means that we also have some arguments that are unique to the way we work. And instead of fighting proprietary software on the, well, who's got the most security holes in their system? Well, you can't say that about proprietary systems because you can't look into them, right? So that's a very, very hard fight to fight. But if you talk about values and talk about how open source is really a part of a really positive movement in the world. You've got something you can talk about that goes way beyond what uh, the proprietary software can. So that's my answer, sort of. But yes, money, everyone wants money. But yes, become a member of the Drupal Association, support open source. That's important. Hmm? So that's the question of you know uh, how how do I relate to, to love when it comes to software, open source software being put out there, but then being exploited by rich corporations that just take and take and take and never give back? You know, we're always going to have that happen. Um, and um, at the same time, by talking about the importance of giving back, we're uh, actually changing some minds, making a little bit of progress on that. It's always going to be a, a fight. But if we stop talking about the important part of giving back, then it's never going to happen. And there is nothing wrong you know, in sitting there at home and downloading an open source piece of software and not paying for it if you don't know about open source. It's nothing wrong about not having money and not paying for you know, a developer who wants to attend a conference. There's nothing wrong in that. But there's a difference between consciously choosing not to and not knowing. And that's why we need to talk about open source, um, because it also makes a pressure on these corporations to actually give something back. Uh, and the, when I talk to people who don't know open source, I often use the example of the cooking recipe. Let's say that you have a really great cooking recipe and you make food for someone and they say, wow, this is a great recipe. Uh, can I have it from you? 
And you say, yeah, sure, I'll write it down, and you give it to someone. And there's two things that can happen. That person starts a you know, burger chain or whatever and, and says that you know, I've got the world's best burgers, and that person does not say that this burger recipe is actually from you. The other way to do it, the more open source way, is to say that, well, you know, a month later, you come back to, uh, to me and give me my recipe and say that, well, you know, I made this improvement. Uh, if you add this or remove that, it's going to be so much better. And that is the community working, because the community contributions actually make the software better. By just taking the software and using it, you're actually not improving it. And that hurts you in the end as well. 